get to read my hand. So, uh, it's a Helen and Hubert dropped into the professor of engineering in the computer science department and an arts and sciences professor of distinction in the linguistics department at the University of Colorado with a Swiss appointment. Uh, uh, she's also an uh, Institute of Cognitive Science faculty fellow, a co-director of CLEAR and an ACL fellow. Uh, her research is focused on capturing elements of the meanings of words that can comprise automatic representations of complex sentences and documents in English, Chinese, Arabic, Hindi, and Urdu, uh, funded by Dr. Uh, and NSF. She is a past president of ECL, past chair of uh, Big Lag, and was, fun, was a fun, uh, founding chair of Big Lag, and has well over 250 peer reviewed publications. So, well, yeah. Thank you very much, Lucerne. And it looks like, are there two people in a room? Somewhere? So, this is the Boston office down there, Waltham yeah. office. Uh, so, who's. Constantine Lee has and probably say something. And then Ryan Gabbard is, also, is from the Kentucky office. And we'll oh, okay. see oh, okay. a quarter of them. We'll see only a quarter of them. So, yes. There might yes. be other people who join. So, hi, Ryan and Constantine and the and other unknown person. Can see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. There's no person on this. It is, who is it? Actually, I don't know who you are across this, the table from Constantine. Could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, I'm Chester, Chester Phelan Michael. Ah, okay, I know you by name, just not by look. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, okay, so it's uh, lovely to be here at uh, Marina Del Rey, especially because the sun came out. So it turned into a beautiful day. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the Blocks World Redux. Mark Steedman assures me that that's the correct way to pronounce the fact he and Jeffrey Pullum got into a big <laughs> argument about it, so I'm not arguing with anybody. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the current challenges of the blocks world and the role of implicit arguments and spatial relations in trying to resolve these challenges and how abstract meaning representations are playing a really important role in our ability or to make progress on this. So first, just to start with the problems, um, and this was when Paul Cohen started the Communicating with Computers DARPA program, uh, at, one of the, at the very first meeting, he gave us these examples. And he said this was our challenge, was to, you know, get in, in trying to communicate appropriately with computers, the computers needed to be able to get the right answers. Um, so just move that over. So here you go. You just, you're building a tower. Somebody says, add a block or add another one or add one more or whatever so what should the computer do should it add another one right here on the top to add another one here and if you're building the tower then you want to add it here but if you were building an l <laughs> if your context was building an l then you might very well want to do this um even if you hadn't, even if he hadn't said, now let's start on the leg of the L. Uh, so, and, and again, if this is the context, you're building a row and you say, add another one, is this what you want to do? Which is kind of the default if you're just continuing the row. Or again, if you were building an L, you know, then maybe this is what you want to do. So uh, he was just sort of encouraging us to uh, take the context into account, but also just make sure that the computer knew the right thing to do with a, sort of a sentence fragment like add a block. So we actually had a, a workshop with about 10 people and then spent a whole day talking about these examples and, and sort of how they should be handled. And what we came up with was, uh, and this should not be too uh, surprising, to, I hope, to anybody hearing this, that the first thing you want to do is some kind of linguistic analysis of the phrase, add a block, add one more, add another, uh, where you detect the implicit arguments. And then using your discourse context, you want to appropriately fill in those implicit arguments, um, which will let you integrate your analysis of that phrase um, with the context and propose, you know, make sure that you're going to the correct next state. And that it's important to have a definition of a composite object in order to do the integration appropriately. 
uh, looking at the linguistic analysis, here's just a simple dependency parse of add a block. You just have add, and you have uh, the block as a dependent off of add. And because uh, we know it's an imperative sentence, we can immediately fill in an understood you as the subject or as another dependent of add. And then we really want to have another dependent. Add a block to what? Okay. And where do we get that? And what do we know about what that could be? So one place we could get that is VerbNet. You could also get it from PropBank or FrameNet, but any kind of resource that gives you subcategorization frames for verbs. Uh, VerbNet would tell you that you would expect an agent, a patient, and a co-patient uh, in this kind of a structure. So, all right, so now what are we gonna do with this co-patient? Well, if we just treat it like a pronoun, like an alighted pronoun, and then we can fill it by co-reference the same way we would a pronoun. Uh, and we can get a little bit more information, again, from VerbNet, because we have this kind of a representation that says that um, if you're adding a patient, so if, you, if this is your syntax here, where you, the only thing that was explicit was patient, that um, you have a, sort of a precondition which says that the patient at the beginning of the event, at, if you think of E1 as the first sub-event, uh, and then you're gonna have an E2 and an E3. At the, in the first sub-event, you have like a precondition that says that um, the patient is not a component of the co-patient. And this question mark here indicates that the co-patient is not instantiated. So you would expect that the syntax here to help you to instantiate the patient, but not the co-patient. You've also got an agent and an unknown agent. Um, in E2, the unknown agent is gonna do something that's gonna cause, E2 is gonna cause a final sub-event, E3, where the patient will be a component of the co-patient. This is a change of state, event type, and E2 and E3. The end of E2 meets the beginning of E3. What's a co-patient? Uh, well, we, we don't, it's generally, it's, it's, what does the term mean? It just means it's a it's another thing that's being affected by the event. Okay, so, that, if you, so if you're using kind of traditional thematic roles, then uh, agents tend to cause things yeah. and patients tend to be affected by the event. Yeah. So this would just be something, more than one thing gets affected by this event. But does, um, a second thing. I guess I'm thinking, are, are we thinking of like the, a patient, it's just saying that it's yet another one as opposed to say like the co-PI, who's you know, not the same thing as the PI. Like, is, are, are we talking equals oh, or is there some just, hierarchy? Yeah, they're equal. Okay, yeah. They're equal, yeah. Right. Huh? Adding something to something, I mean, there are, they're almost, well, they're almost equal, but you're really, it's certainly not subordinate. So in the way that a co-PI would be subordinate. But here, uh, at least a patient sure. is is indicated here, right? The patient is the only thing we've got that was explicit. Gotcha. Right, this is unknown. Kind of like patient two, maybe. Right. Yeah, it's like patient, like you could think of this as, we, we used to actually, initially we called them patient one and patient two. Mm -hmm. One and our. And then, yeah. but, but that meant we had patient and then patient one and patient mm -hmm. two. And we realized eventually, and then we also had agent and agent. Two, and we have theme and theme one and theme two. And we realized we could get, get rid of three thematic role labels by calling them patient and co-patient. So it was just a. So you so you we you don't know for sure. Uh, wait. And that is the. I thought oh. That is the semantics in, in the, is the frame of, of ad. So all we know for sure is that the agent is going to be well. Should, should be capable of intentional control of this event, and that the patient and the co-patient are plus concrete. But the, in this particular context, you do want the co-patient to be some kind of a composite um, overarching structure, and then the patient would be a component of that structure. But these uh, very vague selectional preferences are supposed to apply to all of the verbs in that same class. Um, so that would be pretty specific, more specific than you could do for the whole class. Um, right, so, so the, uh, for any of you who are familiar with VerbNet, there may not be anybody here, um, you will notice that this is kind of a slight change from the previous sort of set of semantic predicates we had associated with this. One of, we've been working recently to try to make 
um, the verb net semantics more consistent with James Pustajewski's dynamic event structure. Um, and th so this, so he actually had as his definition, fairly specific definition for this kind of add that the, at the beginning of E1, that Y is not a component of Z. And at the end, Y is a component of Z. That was the same, that the agent X acts on Y which is our this, like the do thing. And then he also added uh, this, that at the end that Y is on top of Z. That's really specific. <laughs> That's like only true for the tower context. So I think you probably don't. Is that a contradiction even? If Y is a component of Z, can it be on top of Z? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it would depend on how you defined them. But I mean, in some depth, yeah, you could have a world where that those would be in conflict. But, all right, but any act makes uh, from X to Y makes Y some component of something Z? No. Well, I mean, that's obviously what this is not. trying to say, right? Obviously yeah. not. Yeah, right. So, yeah, this is very unspecified. And right. It's very specified. So, yes, yeah, so you probably don't want to do that. Um, we also have been working to try to make things more consistent with uh, Jerry Hobbs's axioms, and I suspect. Oh, this is familiar to most people here, since Jerry's been working on them here. Is in this building? Jerry's in this building. Well, when he's here, Jerry's when he's in this here. building. I know. After I arranged to come, mm -hmm. I got in touch with him, and he's like, I'm going to be out of town. Yeah, <laughs> so usually I'm this whole time. But, uh, yeah, so so where he, and he, where he sort of is, uh, I think, more appropriately vague in saying that um, there's uh, the agent causes something in E0 um, that, um, okay, I always have to think about this. For all A, B, and C. A. Yeah, B is going to be a component of C in E2. Um, e0 and 1 and 2. I think E0 changes E1 to E2, and this is E2 at the Cars end. Does that seem right? Yeah, and then at two is sort of probably the end point, right? Uh, e two is the end. Yeah, we've got one, two, three. He's got zero, one, two. So with e two being the equivalent of our e three, so this is exactly the same, the component thing. And then the agent causes uh, change, and the change e zero is a change from e one to e two. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, and this works obviously for add a block to the stack or add an egg to the cake mix, or add a programmer to the project. But, and this, speaking of how you're never done with semantics, okay, so this all seems fine, right? And we're reasonably consistent, which is absolutely astonishing, by the way, for <laughs> three different people who've been working for <laughs> many, many decades in different directions to be this consistent. We were quite thrilled when we were all at this meeting together, when we realized we were this consistent, we were really we were astonished. But you're not really done, because think about this here, okay? So obviously, if you add a block to the stack, you could then later on remove, or the tower, you could then remove the block from that tower, and you could do something else with it. Same thing, hopefully, with adding a programmer to the project. Project is finished, programmer can work on another project. If you add the egg to the cake mix, you're not ever going to do anything else with that egg, right? That egg is now an integral part of that cake mix. You're not going to ever be able to separate it out. Um, so there are all kinds of interesting, <coughs> subtle nuances to what happens with components being added to composite objects, which we're not even touching on. Could you have some, I, so this could be hopelessly naive, but like, could you like instantiate common sense as um, a like, you know, consequence drop or sentence drop? Basically like, there, like you'd say, add an egg to the cake mix and thus, you know, eliminate the egg's uh, independent existence. Which you would never actually say because you know that through common sense, but so it's just that's just dropped, but it's there. It's just there's two activities going on. I don't think it's even. Um, you certainly would never say that. Uh, but if you if you take a thing that is like soft and mix it in with another thing that is soft, that these things become inseparable, is like you know that that. So it's like you could have an abduction. That you could argue that this is a 
a different sense of ad and that it's more like a mixed sense. Whereas the, I mean, you could get into, there's all kinds of ways you can do it. Okay. There's, um, so you know about the, the, um, Yejin Choi and Kwan and Hannah are doing this, um, sort of common sense knowledge graph stuff. That, so I haven't asked. I, I doubt that what they're doing would get into what's happening here sure. either, although that would be an interesting thing to look at. We never said we need to break the eggs before adding to the. That's true. Right. You don't say that either. And that certainly that's a common sense gap too. Part, of, part of your frame or whatever for what happens when you're cooking with eggs. Right. That you have to crack them. Well, you could literally, you know, a dumb robot. <laughs> yeah, we could exactly. The egg, and, and then, then you could take egg, the egg out. And then you'd have the eggshell mixed in with the no, no, no. too as well. No, no, just a whole egg. And then you like gently stir it up. You're added to, now you can remove the and egg. And then the egg is That's still. <laughs> <laughs> you'd have to do it very gently. Okay. Anyway, so back to the blog squirrel. Job, Sorry. And I, I should warn you, I do have 60 slides, so I shouldn't Sorry. spend too much time on any of them. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, obvious. So here's where our agent, the implicit U, we want to fill that in as the agent. Um, and then if we have, and this is from James Allen, uh, if we have a, and, and his trip system, a discourse history, and if what we said before was let's build a tower, put a block on the table, then we had a previous block that got mentioned. We'll call this block one. We also have a tower that's gotten mentioned. So those are in the discourse context. So since we, if we said add another one, we could use the one to refer back to that block one. We could, that doesn't seem like an impossible co-reference to get, telling us that now we want this thing to be another thing of type block, so that would be a block two. And then uh, we would want to resolve this co-reference as the tower. Okay, and so now we know that our new state at the end should be with block two being a component of the tower, and we're done. Okay, it, we do, want to have a definition of a composite entity, and we get that from Jerry again, uh, and a definition for, I call it a stack here, but for a tower. Um, again, I'm assuming people are familiar with this, um, but if you, uh, I'll give you the slides, you can puzzle over it if you wanna work out the details. Um, and we also, thanks again to ISI and uh, Yon to Disk and Daniel Marku, very quickly got a whole bunch of data of people talking about uh, this blocks world that the communicating with computers program was associated with, uh, where we have all of these blocks and they put logos on them so they'd all be named blocks so they'd be easy to identify. Uh, and you could say things like move NVIDIA to the other side of Mercedes. So here's McDonald's, here's Mercedes, and here's NVIDIA. So when you think, so don't look at this. <laughs> Pretend you can't see this. Uh, when you when you hear that sentence, and here's Nvidia, and here's Mercedes, and it goes, move Nvidia to the other side of Mercedes. What's your first thought on what you should do with that? Mercedes. I know a lot of people say that because right now Nvidia is on the right of Mercedes. So moving it to the other side would be moving it over here. Whereas in fact, what the um, so this was an instruction. Uh, so th so the, the way they collected the data was they showed these two scenes and then they would have the Turkers write instructions to get you from this scene to this scene. And they, they solicited, I think, uh, two or three each from like three different Turkers, like a whole bunch of uh, sort of different ways of providing the same instruction. At any rate, what they actually meant the person to do so maybe in the previous sentence they'd said, put McDonald's on the left side of Mercedes. Uh, now all of a sudden you've got a context where now move NVIDIA to the other side would indicate putting it here. Um, or you might have said, move McDonald's to the other side of Mercedes. Okay, and then you probably would have wanted to do this. So they're lovely data, wonderful data. Thanks very much to ISI for the data. We did our sort of linguistic analysis thing, and we just looking at like about 100 of the sentences, we came up found about seven different sort of move, different kinds of move and put in place templates, lots of different kinds of shapes, and lots and lots of spatial relations. Mostly prepositions, above, below, on top of, right, left, next to, and interesting ambiguities between things like the, are you really 
conceptualizing your scene as a two-dimensional scene, in which case if you say above, you mean sort of you've got this flat x, y thing and you mean further up on the y axis, are you conceptualizing it as a three-dimensional scene where you also have a z axis going this way and if you say above now you mean further up on the z axis. And the, these expressions don't tell you that at all. You have to, again, use the discourse context to figure that out. I thought, well, let's do some annotation, right? That's, I have, I have my hammer, I use it for everything. Uh, we tried looking at uh, prop bank, verb net, extended semantic role labeling from UIUC, preposition super senses, and it was really depressing. None of those gave us anything other than location or direction. It was way too coarse grained, so it wasn't going to be helpful at all. Um, to follow these instructions or to interpret gestures, and there's some uh, very cool teams on, in this program who are using virtual avatars to do this kind of thing, where um, the avatars can, uh, there are a lot of gestures that can be involved as well in the communication. The, in, the instructions and the gestures really want you to get very specific about the magnitude, the extent, the relative locations, directions as vectors, all kinds of specific spatial information um, that we hadn't been trying to deal with at all. This is where AMARS come in, AMARS to the rescue. So I hope all of you are familiar with this website and this data um, that was sort of instigated uh, and developed um, by ISI, especially with lots of help from all here. And uh, the first data set was uh, released in 2013. Uh, there's been a lot more work done on it since. Which is the last one coming up. <laughs> Do you know, I email LDC every two months. And I, every time I get a newsletter from them, I look to see where's the AMR data. And then I email them and say, Stephanie, when is the AMR data coming out? I don't know why they're holding it. 15 months. I know. In, I know. In my experience, if you're on a funded project with the CC, the program manager, they act quicker. But <laughs> oh. have that problem now. <laughs> uh, well, I could still CC Boyan. He's still. Yeah. I, yeah. All right. Okay. Good idea. I'll try that. Um, so, so what are abstract means and representations? Well, I hope everybody knows, but I'll give you just a quick recap. Um, so, first off, one of the things we want to keep track of are semantic role relations, like the agent theme patient stuff. And why do we care about this? Well, it's actually important. So here, to illustrate that, here we have the waiter speaking to the two ladies. I'm sorry, we only serve men in this room. <laughs> and one of them responds with, good, bring us two. <laughs> and why is that funny? Because of a logical incongruity. I've been reading about logic and humor lately. So in the first one, uh, the waiter is intending uh, the men to be labeled as the recipient people who will be served, whereas in the second sentence, uh, the lady is interpreting to them as the theme. They are what is going to be served. So getting these semantic labels right is useful. It's a good thing to do. So we already had a whole bunch of sentences with uh, parse information syntactic analysis, but we added um, the kind of prop bank information. The R0 is doing the giving, the R2 is um, whom it will be given to, and the R1 is what will be given uh, to all of those sentences. Sort of two million plus words of prop bank annotation. Later, um, we started working on abstract meaning representations that include that predicate argument structure, who did what to whom information, but add more stuff on top. So just to kind of very quickly uh, review that. So, for instance, for describe, you'd have an R0, the describer, R1, the thing described, and some kind of R2, which would be a secondary attribute. The thing is described as something. Um, and so then the abstract meaning representation for these three sentences is exactly the same. He described her as a genius, as he described her, she's a genius. His description of her. They're all a described event with he, she, and genius as the three arguments. Back in the Marine, a lot of, <laughs> you're creating a lot of excitement. Yeah, right. Um, the prop bank would actually be exactly the same uh, with 
for these two sentences, it would be different here because syntactically, there are two different syntactic clauses. And so prop bank would have the, as he described her, doesn't, would, the R2 would not be filled in, and then she is a genius. Um, this would be like a predicate of nominative that applies to she. So you'd have to sort of figure out how to put the two things together to get this representation. So AMR uh, abstracts away more from the syntactic structure than prop bank does. So just to uh, very quickly go through uh, a nice example, and these slides, uh, this little string of three slides here are all thanks to Kevin. Uh, John could not have heard about the professor's creation of the microbial viruses that Mary sold to Russia yesterday. This really isn't this bad as you might think. So we're going to say that um, there's a hearing event, okay, John's hearing event. So John is the person, the person with the name John, who's doing the hearing, and then the creation event is what he's hearing about. And this is a possible event, that's the <coughs> little, the could, and it's got a negative polarity because of the not. Okay. And then um, the creation event is the professor's creation of the virus. So here we're treating the verb form and the nominalization form exactly the same way, with the exact uh, same kind of predicate argument structures. Um, he created the virus. It's uh, modified by microbial, and it's an R1 of, this is how relative clauses are handled, a selling event where we have another person named Mary who's the agent of the selling event, and it's being sold to a, in this case, a country called Russia, and the time of the selling event was yesterday. Okay, there you go. Um, another important difference between PropMank and AMRS is AMRS also included discourse connectives. Um, so given something like the House has voted to raise the ceiling to 3.1 trillion, don't we wish the debt ceiling was still 3.1 trillion? <laughs> Never mind. Um, but the Senate isn't expected to act until next week at the earliest. This is a discourse connective. So you've got a voting event here. You've got a polarity negative uh, expecting event here. And there's a contrast relation between those two things. So you'd have contrast at the top with the voting, the expecting underneath. And then, or you can have a concession. So the workers described clouds of blue dust, blah, blah, blah even though exhaust fans ventilated the area. So now you have a concession relation between the description event and the ventilation. Um, so they're quite similar to the Penn Discourse Tree Bank Discourse Connectus, not exactly the same, but quite similar. Um, we weren't able to do kind of a real apples to apples comparison because the Discourse Tree Bank annotated mostly in terse and tension relations and we were doing mostly in trust and tension. Um, so it gives a lot more structuring of the noun phrases. So if you notice all those named entities, we, in fact, the last version is all Wikipied. Uh, it gives interest, intentional co-reference and discourse relations, collapses more ways of saying the same thing. Um, so in fact, it inspired a merge of the separate prop bank noun, verb, and adjective. And also now they're all unified similarly to frame that. Um, and uh, it gives at least a partial representation for negation and modals. Uh, the, using the SMATCH metric to look at annotator agreement um, for the Wall Street Journal sentences, the agreement was about 83. Um, and uh, about 73 for the text, which is much more fragmentary. It's covering a lot more than PropBank does. So it's AMRs give you kind of an abstract, a more abstract labeled dependency tree. It still mirrors very much the dependency relations in the syntax, although it abstracts away from quite a few of them. Without, it drops the function words. Many of the nouns and adjectives have predicate argument structures, the Wikified named entity tags, the abstract discourse relations, and an interpretation of modality and negation, and a few implicit arguments in relation. The equivalence relations for the co-reference are what make it a graph. I think, given the time, this is some stuff on parsing. I think I'm going to skip this, and if anybody's interested in this, we can talk about it in the question and answer session. Uh, but the AMR parsers, here's the bottom line. This this was from last summer. There are probably better results now. Um, they've improved a lot. Uh, this this 
particular paper was up to about a SMAP score of about 74. Um, this is the individual looking individually at the things that are causing trouble. Co-reference is still a huge problem. What is R1 and R2? Huh? What are the data sets? Uh, this, this would have been, I think, the your last uh, SimEval yeah. data set. So you tell me <laughs> what was the data set. I mean, the table specifically is not. Okay, could be, yeah. We have this problem but, that eval data sets not released. Releasing owns it. The second, probably the second general release, right? Yeah, yeah, maybe. And there's the tests. Yeah, yeah. Which has standard division of, yeah. of depth. Right, right. right. Yeah, that's probably what it is. Um, okay, gets used in lots of applications. We'll skip that too. Uh, okay, but there's still a few things we'd like. AMRs to cover. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> don't look like that. All. <laughs> um, there's. It could do more with semantic similarity and sentence distinctions. Although it, none of that would change the structure. If you wanted more fine-grained sentence distinctions, if you wanted vector representations or whatever, you could just add it as like feature values or something to the concept nodes. Um, there are other kinds of constructions um, that we've been adding. Um, and, uh, um, and, and of course, there's always new usages of, of language that haven't necessarily been covered. Uh, metaphors, metonymy, and world knowledge, there's, you know, uh, that, that, that's a whole big open area. That what you to add those? Um, well, metonymy, people have been asking for metonymy, yeah. at least to have it marked. Metonymy is marked. You have to go to the bank today. What's wrong with going to the bank today? Am I going to the facility? Am I going to the institution? That's, I don't think that's metonymy. I think that's just that's just named entity right. tagging. Yeah. So that's probably already done, actually, because if you've got the if well, the bank would be a common noun, so it wouldn't have a named entity tag. But um, but if you gave it a named entity tag, then it would probably give the name of the bank often enough that you could. Learn that from the named entity tags. I'm sure you're used to the kettles of fish. I'm worried about even opening it to a fish can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, I'm just, I'm not saying that we need to do all of these things. I'm just saying um, these are things, these are just open problems in semantics that AMR isn't necessarily solving for us. Implicit arguments and discourse structure, spatial relations, number, tense, and aspect, logic, quantifier, scoping, and temporal and causal relations activity. So we, there has been a lot of progress on quite a few of these. Um, so uh, there's a, we've done some work on multi-word expressions. We've done work on adding more constructions um, and on, uh, on detecting metaphors. Uh, I'm going to talk more today on the implicit arguments and the spatial relations specifically. Um, but I also wanted to say that we have a new NSF grant that is specific, looking particularly at number, tense, and aspect, and logic, and quantifier scoping. Um, this was the third submission of this NSF proposal, <laughs> and that finally got funded. We've also just gotten a new NIH grant uh, that looks at temporal and causal relations, where we're going to be doing AMRs for electronic patient records. Mm -hmm. This is also the third submission of this particular <laughs> NIH journal. So persistence is really important. <laughs> if, if, you, if you've got something you want to do, keep asking. Um, and we're and huh? For everybody who got rejected from ACL, remember. Oh yeah. What was oh, the MLP? No, so really, conference rejections, you cannot take those seriously. There <laughs> may, about twenty percent of the papers get accepted, right? Maybe twenty-five percent if you're lucky. Every conference I have ever been a reviewer for, there's another twenty-five percent of papers that are just as good as half the ones that got accepted. That fell just barely below that cutoff point because one reviewer was biased or ignorant or got confused or didn't read the paper or whatever. <laughs> so you just resubmit it. You, you take the reviews, say, okay, these reviews are useful. They're going to help me improve the paper. And then you resubmit it. And you cannot, you cannot let it bother you. 
Thank you. It's totally arbitrary. <laughs> um, right. Yes. Oh, so I was, and um, as part of the NSF grant, we're, we have a workshop at ACL. My, my three ACL submissions all got rejected too, but luckily <laughs> I'm running a workshop at ACL, so I still get to go to Florence. <laughs> Um, called Designing Meaning Representations. Uh, please come to the workshop. Uh, please, if you can't come to the workshop, so give us white papers on what you think are the most important things to do with um, meaning representations. The grant is specifically to look at cross-lingual representa meaning representations and what are the things that the English AMRs are doing that are, might cause problems for other languages? How can we make them more kind of uh, generally applicable? Um, so back to communicating with computers. Uh, so here's our sentence, move NVIDIA to the other side of Mercedes. So I'm going to try to convince you for why AMRs are useful now, why, we, why they're going to help us do this special relations stuff. Um, so here's, here's our move event. We've got NVIDIA. And AMRs already had this uh, representation of a relative position. So you're going to move the NVIDIA to a position that is relative to the other side of Mercedes, okay? Now, you still have to fill in, you have to figure out what the first side of Mercedes was. In order to figure out what the other side is, you still have to decide, use co-reference or context or something. So what is the R2 here? Was it, is, was the, is it, did we just put McDonald's on the left-hand side? And so this is gonna be the left-hand side. And so then this is gonna be the right-hand side. Or is NVIDIA already on the right-hand side? And so the contextually relevant side is the right-hand side. And so this is going to be on the, this will, this will end up being on the left-hand side. So you still got to do that part, but at least you've got a structure uh, that defines where it goes and what the, how it's going to be interpreted. Plus, we already had, AMRs gave us all this extra information that we could use, all these extra relations that we could use to get much more specific about the, um, the spatial relations. So if we'd said three inches to the right of, okay, we've got a distance quantity, we, it's a, the unit is inch, the direction is to the right. Okay, so, we're, so it's giving us um, the right kind of slots we need to get more specific. So, um, so what do we do? We've been creating frame sets. It turns out there are at least, uh, we've added um, 77 new frames, 46 of which were just updating old frames, but uh, more than 30 were just prepositions, special prepositions that we didn't have. It means we're doing a whole bunch of prepositions now as frame files, uh, as well, and adverbial relations. Um, so it includes verbs, nouns, adjectives, and multi-word expressions. We've got 10 new function tag types. We have to think about this two-dimensional versus three-dimensional ambiguity. We have to think about um, the, when you're talking about spatial relation, relations, it's always relative to somebody's viewpoint. So the anchor is telling you, um, anchoring the viewpoint for you. Uh, and we're, we're now having created all these, we're mapping them to uh, Jerry's axiomatizations, uh, to James's um, ISO space relations and his VoxML, that's for visual object markup language. In coordinating, we have a group of people, uh, Sohan Dan, who's a Penn student, Risa, Elaine, uh, and Archana Bhatia from HMC, and we're all working together on sort of trying to come up with a general consensus on how to do all this. So we've got a spatial ontology now that's divided into locations, directed motion, and metaphorical directed motion. Locations include stuff like uh, within or functions as part of the whole, adjacency, directed motion could be static orientation, change of location, change of orientation. You get the general idea. Um, let me come back to this minute. Uh, so, so here, this is a Google Drive, Google Sheet that I could share with anybody who's interested in this stuff. It gives you a lot more detail than you ever wanted to know about all these special relations. Uh, here's the column for Jerry's axiomatizations. This is for VoxML. I'm going to zero in. This first one up here is above, so let me uh, zoom in on that a little bit. So the definition is that it's higher on some axis as oriented by a specific anchor. 
The block is above. So here's some examples. The block is above the doll. Um, and then this is saying that's upward on an axis running from the doll's feet to the head. The block is above the doll relative to the sky ground or gravity. Uh, but here's the frame set. So above has an arc one. The thing is that the thing that you're putting above the arc two is the landmark. It's above what? This is for a trajector, the thing that may, be, may get moved. Uh, it, the landmark is what it is above. The anchor is the entity whose orientation determines up or down. And then the axis is whether it's the y-axis or the z-axis. Um, so Jerry has axiomatizations for a two-dimensional above and a three-dimensional above. This actually covers both of them because you just change the axis. Um, the voxing, the voxML uh, from James Pustyowski is just the two-dimensional above. Okay, here's where that slide was supposed to be. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, that, so, so that's sort of what we've been doing on spatial relations. Another important piece of this is the implicit arguments. So we started doing this with the AMRs. So there's a co-link paper on the AMR beyond the sentence, the multi-sentence AMR corpus, which is one of the things that hasn't been released yet. Um, so basically the idea is if you're talking about let's build a tower, start by stacking four blue blocks, add a block. So this is... Uh, what you could do right now with AMR, you, and you could put in the implicit U. What you'd like to do is notice that um, here you've only got the arc zero and the arc one. Here you've got an arc two and an arc three. So what happened to those, right? Those didn't get mentioned, but we can uh, automatically add them in as the implicit thing being added to and the. Um, Oh, sorry. Yeah. Add in the R2 is the implicit thing being added to. And um, and then we're, we're doing the annotation of the multi-sentence corpus. If this relates to any previous mention, you can add it to the co-reference chain. So we already had the tower. We had an identity chain for the tower. That was previous mention. So we can just add this to the co-reference chain for the tower, and now we've got that instantiation. Um, if we had said, uh, let's build an L, then we could do the same thing. It would just be the L instead of the tower. We've done this with a whole bunch of discourse form sentences. Here's an implicit argument here. Here's the identity chain it gets added to. Um, there's actually an 8,000 sentence data set that was delivered to LDC 15 months ago <laughs> that is still not been released. Um, okay, so, but we, we still need more data though for it to, because the, the data we had from ISIA wasn't discourse. They weren't, it wasn't dialogues. It didn't give us a discourse context. So Julia Hockmeyer um, and her team at UIUC created a blocks world environment in Minecraft so that they could literally had two students sit down at each one at one, comp at two different laptops and play this blocks world thing with one of them being the architect and one of them being the builder. And that, she could, so we could collect dialogues. So now we've got a whole bunch of data with implicit arguments. This is going to be, um, this paper got accepted in ACL. It's the only one I've heard of of any of the people I've talked to whose paper got accepted. Um, and uh, Julia Bond and Kristen wright Bettner have been doing uh, abstract meaning representations for all of this dialogue. Uh, so it might say something like, we're almost done, actually. <laughs> Make a two by three rectangle out of yellow. Oh, why did I think it was red? Never mind. Out of red. Um, sorry. Out of yellow. Uh, and then the builder actually puts down six yellow blocks, right? And it says exactly, it grounds it, so you know exactly where each block is being put. 
And then the architect says, now add a block under the bottom right. Oh, I'm sorry, this says block. It should actually say corner under the bottom right corner. Of what? Bottom right corner of what? Of this rectangle. Okay. So, so can we do that? Well, we can do it manually. I'm not saying, I'm not going to tell you we can do it automatically yet. But <coughs> so here's the AMR for the make a two by three rectangle. And notice here's the rectangle. This is important. We're going to come back to that. Here are the dimensions of the rectangle, and the, the things are all yellow. It doesn't even tell you that they're blocks, right? But you can figure that out. We have a very small domain, so we can figure out. The only yellow things are the blocks. Um, and then this first action, the builder puts down a yellow block, is going to be, we actually do AMRs for these. It's real simple. We can do them automatically with script because it's an important part of the context. This is an important part of the grounding, is you want to know that you've got these six blocks and you want to know where each one is. Um, so here's, so the builder puts down the block and this is where it gets put down. So here's all the action sentences. So you can think of each of these put down events, with P1 through P6, as sub events of the original making process when you were making the rectangle. And you've got six yellow blocks that have now been grounded with the, instantiated with the actual blocks. Um, I really thought that's a corner. Um, now add a block. An easier way to do it, right? The block is easier. Yeah, I think it, I think it used to say corner. But, 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 but bottom right still implies an understanding of the, of the existence of the rectangle, right? Because what does bottom right mean otherwise? Right, well, so here's bottom. Uh, so, and here's the definition bottom right here which there's a thing at the bottom it's the bottom of what and it's got the anchor and the axis mm. so it's the bottom of the rectangle and then here's the right and it's again here's right thing uh, the thing on the right on the right of what and then the anchor and the axis so it's on the right of the rectangle um, and it turns out that when you Take the find the bottom and find the right. It ends up being the third block that was placed originally placed because they did the blocks the bottom row first. Did the so what did you think it said originally under the bottom? The bottom right corner. Might which would be you'd end up with a slightly exactly different location thing. usually. I don't know. The bottom right corner would still be the would bottom still be the bottom below? most rightmost block. You wouldn't necessarily go like diagonally one to the bottom right of that rectangle? Oh, yeah. I, well, under the bottom right corner? Yeah, under the bottom right block is definitely... It's much more specific. But then you've also got to figure out that you want under that under to be the y-axis instead yeah. of the z-axis, that you want it to be a two-dimensional under. Or, because otherwise you'd be picking up the block and putting oh, it Oh, that's true. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't say that. Right it was the Z. Oh, you might. Yeah. So we've got about 4,000 dialogue sentences that we've done the sanitation for, and we're now going back and doing all the implicit arguments. We've got about 6,300 of the action sentences, which are more or less done automatically. We've just started retraining Jammer with help from Jeff Flanagan on this data to see what we can get with it. Um, We've added all these new tags to the AMR tool set and the new prepositions and adverb party speech frame files. Um, we're working with Claire Bonial, who's at the Army Research Lab, who has the Scoutbot data set, which is, again, dialogue. It's all about giving instructions. There's this uh, Scoutbot, and there's someone, a uh, uh, handler, who's giving instructions to the Scoutbot about navigating an environment. Uh, that the where the robot is in the environment, but the navig navigator is not. Okay, so this is done uh, remotely. So it's kind of a similar data set with a lot of the same spatial relations and things. And so um, they've been adding speech acts. So we're going to learn how they added the speech acts. We're going to show them what we've been doing with spatial relations and try to get the two data sets annotated as um, consistently as possible. Um, so. The AMRs have given us very a very useful semantic approxim approximation with an underlying skeletal structure that we're able to 
um, enrich with the uh, types of information that we need for this application uh, and the potential for capturing the implicit arguments which we need for the discourse. So now maybe next time I'll be able to tell you how well it all works. So thank you. I want to Okay, questions? Um, I guess, yeah, you're setting it up that it, maybe it's it's too early to say like, oh, but you know, what, what do we, you know, how will it work? That's what comes next. But I wonder just- The implicit argument recovery is really hard. I mean, the co remember I did, I, there was a spoiler alert when I said, look at how badly the AMRs are doing on co-reference, 50%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is harder than normal co-reference. I just recovering the implicit arguments. So Tim O'Gorman is doing his dissertation defense on recovering implicit arguments in a few, in about a month. His results are not great. <laughs> he'll still pass. Oh yeah, he'll pass. No, he did a linguistic analysis of different types of implicit arguments, so he was, you know, that works. I guess what I'm I'm skeptical of is that like. You know, so let's say we can do a noisy, I mean, we're never, we're not going to be noisy, right? A noisy parse of something, right? Um, where, yeah, so you want to try to figure out, let's just say it's, um, make it simple and um, basically like all slow, right? So given that this is the world and given that these are the statements, what should the consequence be? So make, you know, and we can, we can take away the vision if we want and make it a purely textual thing and, and, and make it one of those. Um, and so I would imagine that if this is, if this is all going to work, that you're going to be able to do a better job somehow predicting the right answer with the AMR information versus just, you know, plain. Wait, but you just made a, a common sense reasoning challenge instead of, I mean, the this is all focused on getting the spatial, getting you enough details about the spatial relations that you can actually figure out where you're putting things. I put it in the common sense framework, but it is still the same. It's just because that's the same setup, right? I mean, whether whether you argue if it's common sense or proper linguistic analysis of, I mean, <clears throat> proper semantic analysis, right? So I guess okay, I'm not I'm not trying to say that it's necessarily needs whatever whatever common sense reasoning. I don't understand what I'm saying, but like. You should still, you should be able to set up like, imagine there is a, um, you know, there, there is a line of five blocks next to each other, or there's a block at one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, and one, five. Um, I, you know, I tell you add a block, what, you know, and then the, the next step is I add a block at one, six, and the other block is I add a block at two, one, right? Mm -hmm. So you could argue that, I'm uh, sorry, I tell you add, add another block to the line or something like that. So, mm -hmm. so that. If you do a proper no, semantic there's analysis, there's no ambiguity there, right? You've made there is there is no there is no ambiguity, and the question is whether or not um, a surface text versus a parsed text will be better uh, able to will be able to somehow extract information that leads leads us to make the right decision more more frequently with the parsed text than with enough surface text or something like that, and. Not sure. You mean just if you had tons and tons of data, just train a neural net on the words or the characters? Sure, that's the, that's the versus you know, script versus approach. do the, all of this kind of analysis. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think the so I think the just the surface text. Well, given enough data, <laughs> the surface text might be able to do okay. I think the problem is the implicit arguments mm -hmm. and and instantiating them correctly right. and and that this gives us a head start it gives us a framework for being able to do that you're showing where you have to put the implicit arguments right what has well to right and the, and the thing that we should be able to take advantage of here is that we have all this um you know we we know a lot about uh this bottom relationship and, and we have we I mean, there's, we've got this frame file here. We've also got, you know, Jerry's axiomatizations. We've got the VoxML representations. We've actually got some, a lot of specific information about what it means to be on the bottom. That should really help constrain 
uh, what the possibilities are. And then we've got a whole another set of constraints here. So, I mean, th this is, yes, yes, this is all symbolic. This would all um, involve really taking advantage of this would require using some kind of reasoning right. about applying the constraints and filtering out the your your set of possibilities until you have a small enough set that you're much more likely to get the right answer. So that seems to be the key, actually, is that um, uh, there's potential. There's many ways to say, you know, the, the big deal with AMR is right. There's lots of different ways to say what's the same the same AMR. Right, so mm -hmm. you could just manipulate your training data by, uh, you know, re replace things with the not only just the surface parts, but whatever the worked out conclusions need to be, right? But and that, we, I mean, that's basically what we're doing when we put in. I mean, the the right. manual annotation is putting in all of the you right said, reference for the implicit arguments. Okay, yeah. so so yeah, so we're we're, <clears throat> you know, mm -hmm. so that's. So the question is, is it going to be easier to learn from that than right. it would be to learn from just the raw data? Right. <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I'm betting on this, or I wouldn't have put the last two years into it. Uh, I think this is going to be useful. Okay. And, and I think the main reason it'll be useful is because it does put so many constraints. You know, you've got all this structure around that can help you sort of zero in. <laughs> Additional structure that you didn't have just from the surface text. Which, and it should help, I mean, it should generalize. Okay, so I mean, if, let's say we had, you know, millions and millions and millions of words of the original ISI data and this Minecraft dialogue. And then you could train some surface thing that would do a decent job. But then you move to another domain right. where you've got some other kind of, you're building something else and you've got some other kind of dialogue going on. You're gonna need the same amount of data. I mean, I don't see how you're very much of what you've learned from the blocks world is gonna generalize, you know, to this other construction. Just domain by the surface this, text. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Whereas this um, uh, the recovery of the implicit arguments and applying the constraints, all of that should generalize. Right. Well, I hope. I guess I don't know enough about like semantics and languages other than English. I would hope these things would be universal. Oh, this should. Yeah, this should all. Ah, I just well, don't know. actually, we haven't looked at the. We haven't tried to look at the spatial relations in other languages. Right. Um, so I don't know how well those those would map, but the I mean if you go back to all the way back to this these kinds of things um, you know you might end up putting different words and maybe maybe in another language this would be two different words instead of just the you know the two dimensional above and three dimensional above maybe maybe it'd be two different words. Um, you know, maybe other things would be one word for what we've got is two or three different concepts, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, actually, it's very contextual. Um, special relations in other languages depend. Or maybe comp compositionality, like, let's, let's assume that you did mean under the right block before, right? And I could imagine a case where, like, no, when you make a square out of, out of composite pieces, there no longer is a right block, right? What do, you, so what do you mean right block? There's no right block, there's only this rectangle, you know, or something like that. Or, or, or the rectangle itself is now the lower right block because that's just that block and so you just place something in the center. Like, I, again, without enough knowledge about how semantics might differ between cultures, but I, I, I would probably argue that you're gonna be a better, it's a closer match than, than just this surface text between languages. Like, I think you're right, but there's probably some shades of difference. I don't know, Chinese, Chinese AMR bank would probably be a good place to yeah. look yeah. closer. Yeah. If I should be correct, you annotated several thousand sentences there. Uh, this corpus, uh, 6,000 or so. 
and I mean, I can imagine that just having this corpus, you know, will will help you to, you know, uh, fill some implied object there. So if you have several hundred uh, dialogue sentences where you add something to a tower. This, this the tower probably, becomes very This is likely. probably a good, good, you know, one possible good, good candidate. Yeah. So you can basically look at that, uh, basically the language model as, as uh, described by the corpus of dialogue sentences mm -hmm. of what's likely, uh -huh. um, target language uh -huh. model. Uh -huh. And then you have sort of like your constraints uh, from, from your um, frames. Right. And how much do they contribute there in filling the roles? Is it, are you trying to fill them mostly uh, through the semantic restrictions of the frames, or do you use heavily corpus of dialogue sentences as a target language model to kind of help you guide towards the most plausible interpretation? Well, Tim has been using um, both. Uh -huh. um, he he sort of he's been doing the discussion form data, uh, which is actually a lot harder than this. I, I think this is probably going to be a lot easier because mm -hmm. it's much more constrained. Uh, but he's got a, a way he's done uh, sort of come up with kind of vector representations of uh, typical frame fillers mm -hmm. um, for for each slot, typical slot fillers for each frame. Um, and, and then he's also got just sort of some kind of language model thing. Discussion form is so um, broad that, yeah, that the neither, I mean, they both help a little bit, but not as much as you would hope. Whereas I think they would help a lot more with this. Right, I mean, because, because you know, if you have 4,000 yeah. sentences for, for a similar. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. So the multi sentence annotation is very interesting. So, how many sentences max is it like just a couple of sentences? Can it be scaled to a chapter? Can so it be scaled the... to a book? 8,000. Yeah, but it was, uh, where was that? What slide was that? Um, so this was, no, where, yeah, the, the, this was within each document. So whatever the document was, if it was a particular discussion forum post, or if, I mean, most of it, these tend to be fairly like, no more than a couple pages at the most. They're like newspaper article length. It's a lot harder to do co-reference for something that's 20 or 30 pages long. Um, but what you could do with something like that is just try to mark the most important um, protagonists or something in the chapter, and then and then keep the sort of the rest of the co-reference like a kind of moving two page one more one or two page window kind of thing but any of the really important things you you keep those around so that you could continue right. including them in a co-reference chain so um will we be able to build an amr for an entire book at some point of time maybe make a program that give me the book and get an amr of this book I mean, it understood everything in the book so, I mean, that is my kind of sort of dream uh, that at least, um, I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm so interested in the temporal and causal relations between things, because they can uh, really help connect macro events so that you can sort of think in terms of coming up with a, you know, a, a graph of, you know, a long story. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, I think that should be a like a one objective for an yeah, view, right? Yeah. So you understand the bigger picture. Yeah, yeah. So um, we're certainly looking at the idea of <coughs> uh, so for the patient record stuff, which again the electronic patient records um, for the AMRs for that, 
So that is where we're looking at the temporal and causal relations between things. I, we've done, we were doing a little bit of that for general purpose AMRs too, but the patient record thing I think is a, a much smaller sandbox. And these and the patient, the clinical notes are also fairly short. Now we have a whole bunch of them for a particular patient. So here we want to identify the important events in each note and then create a timeline for that patient. So that you know what the original symptoms were, what the original diagnosis was, what the treatments were, what symptoms recurred, what symptoms didn't, what treatments worked, what treatments didn't, was were there later diagnoses down the line, were there addition different treatments down the line, you know, yeah. so you could pull out the whole timeline. And we can use that as a pattern to learn if there are any pattern and then use that yes. to predict what yes. happened to Yes, people. exactly. That's the whole point. So that to, in my mind, it's much more feasible to try to do that with this electronic patient record stuff because you're just looking at a particular medical. It, I mean, obviously, some patients will have additional medical issues that come in, but you're sort of focusing on one particular kind of medical issue and then and one particular patient at a time. And then later on, you want to aggregate, you know, all the patients who had this particular diagnosis and this particular treatment. What are the outcome pattern for those patients? So that I can kind of imagine us making that work. I, go, go, you know, obviously that's exactly what you'd want to be able to do with your book. <laughs> um, the, so currently so, it's uh, science fiction, but someday it won't happen, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. If we can get it to, you know, if we can get it to work for the patient stuff. I think that's promising. <laughs> yes. Is the way the AMR was built language specific or can it be extensible, extendable? To yes. So it was not, it was not supposed to be English specific. It, there are a lot of ways in which it is kind of English specific. So that's that that's one of the main themes for this workshop, this designing representation workshop is, you know, uh, we're really interested in having people who have, are working with other languages who maybe have tried to do AMRs who've run into problems. We'd love to have them tell us about those problems. And do they have suggestions for how to make the AMR a bit more general? Um, I just recently heard somebody talking about uh, Chinese and they said, so AMR has, you know, possible a certain modal modality um, relations, uh, so possible and obligated or any more. Yeah, so there are some that are pretty language independent. Also, we have these kind of have organization rule. Like, yeah, no, this was just for the modal stuff, yeah, just yeah, for yeah. things, you know, this is in the domain of possible, this is in the domain of obligated. I know there's a couple more, I can't think of them right now. And they were saying, well, Chinese has we would need to add a couple modality types if to cover all the ways in which Chinese can express modality. So I thought that was interesting. I, you know, like to hear some other people weigh in and see whether or not they agree with that. But so that's exactly the, you know, you know, have we, um, you know, have we allowed for all the possibilities that other languages might consider? In, in the our choice of semantic rep represent relations for modality or for, for spatial relations or you know these different things. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, all of our semantic relations for AMR are English words, so there's that kind of thing um, too. You know, that I'd be actually interested to kind of know what they are. You know, sometimes languages have modalities that might mean something like want. You know, they're just it's expressed as a non mm -hmm. verb in English. Yes. Or something perfectly yes. available, but it right. doesn't have quite the bone of flavor in English as it might have another. Right, mode. right. And so should we yeah. you know, take take the English want and so that might be add it as a solution a, for some of those cases, right, but it would right. be interesting to hear. Right, right. Express right. It. Yeah.
Professor on the Master is joining us from the machine. Uh huh. You were running around a lot? Been running around a lot. Engage a little bit more than, than uh, uh -oh.